Have you ever had a day where you just couldn't get out of bed? When you felt that your energy had been zapped? I certainly have. There was a time where I had to redefine well-being for myself and make it a priority in my life. And I also realized that I wanted to help others do that too. And that's what led me here as the well-being leader for Deloitte and your host of the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk about all things well-being. I travel quite a bit in my job, and I'm constantly meeting people at all different types of organizations and at all different levels. And do you know what question I get the most? How can I get a title like yours? I know it's a unique title, and it's one that I'm really proud of. But it all starts by building a business case for investing in well-being at your organization. And today, I want to help you do just that. We will be talking to a researcher about why well-being is so important to high performance. We will talk to a talent leader about what organizations should focus on to build a better bottom line. And we will talk to a team leader who can provide practical advice on how to embed well-being into the day-to-day. I settled on this notion that we're a leadership culture focused on the development and well-being of all of our people. And that was based on our own knowledge of our people that really spoke to what drove the millennial generation. Because at Deloitte, that's about 55, approaching 60% of our population. We have to design structures and systems that will engage and attract talent because the research is out there. The building block of any great business case starts with science. What does the research say? Today, we're joined by Dr. Kelly Monahan. She's a subject matter specialist at Deloitte Center for Integrated Research, and her research focuses on the intersection of behavioral economics and talent issues within an organization. Kelly and I, along with our colleague Mark Cotelier, authored the paper, Does Scarcity Make You Dumb? It's a behavioral understanding of how scarcity impacts our decision-making and control. Before we dive into this conversation, can you define what you mean when when you talk about scarcity? Yeah, so we do take a somewhat of a different approach than you might traditionally think of. What we're talking about when we talk about scarcity is really the mindset that is invoked when you face an unmet urgent need. So we know as humans, we're biologically wired to respond to certain needs, but we really wanted to understand what's happening in your mind as you're facing the unmet urgent need. And today, you know, before, historically I should say, you know, it was food, shelter, clothing, those basic needs were our source of scarcity. However, we're making the argument in this paper, it's less and less physical resources and more and more cognitive resources. Mm-hmm. So time, mental energy, Um, We look a lot even at relationships and loneliness, and we're starting to see that a state of scarcity looks really different than how it looked previously, but it manifests itself in the exact same ways to our brains. And so when you're talking about mindset, it could be, scarcity could be real or perceived. 100%. And I think in a lot of places, in our workplaces, we're seeing a lot of perceived scarcity. So people are showing up every day, you know, physically present, but they're mentally elsewhere. And there's a great, um, actually, example of this that might help bring this to light. So there's a study done out of um, New Haven, Connecticut, that wanted to examine the impact train tracks had next to an elementary school. And they thought that the physical noise had have been impacting learning. And so that should come as no surprise that, of course, the students who sat on the side of the building where the train was passing by were um, much less behind their their classmates who sat on the other side of the building. But the magnitude is what surprised researchers. Those um, students were nearly a year behind simply because of the rattling trains that were passing by. And so what researchers out of Harvard have proven is today we might not have physical rattling trains going through our offices, but in our brains we all have a sense of train that we're constantly being pulled away from. Again, whether that's time, a deadline, relationship, just a sense of overwhelmedness that causes us to face that scarcity and puts us um, just as behind as rattling trains would be. It seems like uh, for many, our own human nature, as you said, or the need to constantly be on the go, doing, accomplishing, is at odds with our mental capacity to make good decisions and operate at our best. Yeah, so within the paper, we talk about three specific ways that scarcity makes us dumb or influences us. And the first is it creates a lot of noise within our brains. So we're biologically wired to respond to an unmet urgent need. 
And back in the day, this was very positive for us. So, you know, if we saw a line on the road, our fight or flight response was immediately kicked in and we responded to Run and get out of the way. <laughs> Absolutely. So today in corporate America, we're not necessarily facing lions, but we're facing a different type of unmet urgent need. And that might come in the form of time, relationships, even resources. And so unfortunately, our brain does not differentiate between the line in the road or a really tight deadline or competing, you know, priorities. And, and so biologically and hormonally, we actually respond the exact same way. And in the long term, this creates a lot of obviously stress. And so we then have to decide, okay, do we take a fight or flight response or do we continue doing the task at hand? And this quite frankly just exhausts us. And so then the third thing is we we experience decision fatigue. And so there's this fascinating study that um, one of our colleagues talks about which describes that judges in Italy were granting parole simply based on time of day. So if you went before the judge earlier in the day, you were much more likely to have a a less biased and rational decision made on your case. But as the day progressed, you were much less likely to be granted parole. Because of fatigue. Because of decision fatigue. So, you know, scarcity really just biologically brings on these three things. One, the constant noise and interruption to respond to the need which then forces us to make trade-off decisions, which then leads us really fatigued throughout the day. So, but is there ever a time, you know, from all of the research that we know about stress, stress in itself can actually be a performance enhancer. Um, Mm -hmm. It's chronic stress or stress over a long period of time that then becomes detrimental, leads to health problems, leads to burnout. Um, And I think you know, scarcity in in some ways, or at least in in business, um, can be used or come to life in in kind of a similar way. And so people can use scarcity to enhance performance in the short term. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point. So, you know, the fact of the matter is scarcity does work in the short term. It it motivates us to act. You know, as we talked about before, it does motivate that fight or flight response. And so you will see high performance in the short term. However, in the long term, we know that it's not sustainable and that burnout is going to happen. And you're actually going to see in the long term diminished levels of performance. So while you might get that short-term spike, in the long run, you're going to be far worse off. And there was actually this fascinating study, though, just the upside of scarcity that researchers out of Princeton University conducted. And basically, they went and looked at shoppers, grocery shoppers' habits. And they wanted to know, they went to a wealthy suburb in Princeton and randomly asked participants, do you know about how much money you're spending within your grocery basket? Or do you know about how much per unit a bushel of apples is this week? And the wealthy participants really had no clue. <laughs> they were <laughs> they were off. But then they went into um, some of the more you know socially economic depressed areas in New Jersey, and they asked the same questions. And those shoppers knew almost to the exactly. penny what was in their cart. And so we know when we don't have, when we're facing an unmet urgent need, it does make us an expert in the very thing we lack. And we see this, dieters tend to know much more how many calories they're consuming compared to someone who's not. So it does breed a sense of expertise in the short term, but of course, long term, it's not worthwhile. That's a fascinating example. But I also feel like, um, you know, rest and recovery doesn't have to be, you know, I'm I'm taking, you know, six weeks off or, you know, so it doesn't have to be something big. There are things that you can do throughout your day to build recovery into your day to, you know, to kind of take you out of, mm-hmm. you know, I guess, that scarcity mindset is, yeah. is really what we're talking about here. Yeah, no, I, I think you're spot on with that. So we know from the research that as humans, we're, we're really bad at taking care of our future selves. <laughs> you know, cognitive, it's called a cognitive bias, which is the planning fallacy. So in the present, we tend to make um, decisions that have long-term consequences and cost such as rest and recovery. And so what we found in some of the research we've actually been doing here at Deloitte is if we can get managers and leaders to take 15 minutes a week to focus on their mindset, you know, why are they there, almost recenter their purpose of why they're leading teams, and really just do a check-in with themselves, it has had tremendous impact on employee engagement scores. And so we've seen, um, honestly, quite surprisingly, upwards of 20, 30 percent employee engagement increase this year in those targeted regions where we've just had managers take a step back. And it's 15 minutes because if you tell them, you know what, you need to go change your mindset or for the next 12 months, you need to increase employee engagement. It feels engagement. like this huge thing that I have to oh, do. We don't even yeah. know where to start. Yeah. But if we say, hey, you know what, take 15 minutes um, to start. We called it Mindset Mondays to really focus and plan your week accordingly. And it, during that time, turn off your emails, do those small behaviors you will read, and it's a cumulative effect, you know, much 
like I know some of the meditation research has, the more you do it the in the long term, the better it actually becomes. One of the things that, that, that I often hear, mm-hmm. especially from, you know, busy professionals that, you know, have a career and a life and a family is that they don't have the time mm-hmm. to focus on themselves and their well-being. And it feels like a mountain to climb. Mm-hmm. So they just don't, right? Yeah. And so I think the challenge is, especially in, in corporate America, is we're always looking in human nature, we're looking for the big solutions, yeah. the big change. And rarely, and, and there's really no example I can and think of. And fast results, And fast right? results, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> change these 10 things and prioritize all 10. Yeah. Um, but research suggests that it's it's really the small behaviors that you have to practice over and over again. And sometimes that takes a lot of discipline. Yeah. And I think that's a much harder message to infuse than trying to present leaders with a, you know, a 10-step change program that's going to solve the well-being issue that's happening. So what the research shows is we looked a lot at high-performing athletes and especially Olympic athletes. And we mm-hmm. wanted to understand what really differentiated those that performed well in the Olympics. So you already were a high performer, but really what separated those? And it was the small behavior changes they made during practice. So not even during the performance. And so I think there's a lot of application to that when we think through people and the way that they go about their life. What are those small habits that they can start to change? And it's all about creating that mental space between yourself and the environment and being able to control to some level. And I think find those two, five, ten minute slots and it goes back to discipline, turning off the email, (laughs) putting the phone away, um, you know, creating that space to really center yourself and, and make that a practice. Yeah, one, one of the things that, and somebody gave me this advice along the way, mm-hmm. if you look at my calendar, I actually block time on my calendar. You look at my calendar and it says breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, yeah. dinner, you know, or I block time. If I see that my calendar's starting to get too full, I block the rest of the time out on my calendar so no one can schedule it. So that's time for me. But, you know, building that in a way into your yeah. everyday life that, reminds you to, to do these things until they become habitual. Yeah. And I think to your point, you have to be so intentional with it. So yeah. you could practice, but if you're practicing the wrong things, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I think being intentional with that is, is spot on. Even if you say those things, I know for me and my own my own personal self, if I get an email, I'm going to read it. And the fact that somebody's telling me not to respond, if it, it still is going to have emotional response, right? And so if it's an email that's disappointing to me or tells me on Monday, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, and I was planning to do something else on Monday morning, it still does elicit an emotional response, kind of the hormonal response in your body. Yeah. So, Well, there's actually, so there is there is a science exactly behind yeah. what you're just saying. So it's funny because we understand, I'll tell you the science and then what my boss is now doing as a result of it. Um, neuroscience has showed that we think in one of two manners, top-down processing, which is when we're rational and logical. Um, but bottom up is when we have a sensory information, it's we just respond to the environment around us. So when you read the email, your top down rational cognition that's saying, no, don't respond to this email this weekend is involuntarily being interrupted by the bottom up process, the stimuli. Interesting. It, you can't. It's yeah. again, it's just the way we're wired. You can't do anything about it. And so my boss recognizing this and in, in, in doing this science what he does now, there's an amazing feature in um, Outlook that delay, allows you delivery, to delay yeah. delivery. So yeah. he now, knowing, he'll do all his emails Saturday morning, but knowing no matter what, that we will involuntarily ha- feel the need to respond, delays it until we get it Monday morning. So let me play devil's advocate okay. on that a little bit. For me, um, I actually rather get an email on the weekend okay. and be able to process it and plan my week because yep. I'm a planner. Whether there's a planning fallacy or yeah. not, I'm still a planner. <laughs> yeah, right. I love that. <laughs> um, um, but and so, I I would find it more stressful to get a whole bunch of emails on Monday morning than yeah. I would to get it on the weekend and actually be able to kind of plan. Okay, this is how I'm going to deal with it when Monday morning hits. So I think there's like any good yeah. science or any yeah. you know any good research, there's probably differing points of view on on that. Yeah, and I think, so that brings up a good point that I think is a recurring theme, is there is no one size fits all right. to well-being. You know, we're individuals, we have different preferences. And I think what's not happening enough is those communications in the workplace. Yeah. So whether or not, do you prefer weekends on the email or emails on the weekends? Or do you want to kind of come on Monday morning, have your cup of coffee and get yeah. your 20, 30 emails? Um, the more we can dialogue and be open with each other and we will work better that yeah. way. Well, that's, I mean, that's probably communication is yes. key to well-being, but also so many other things in exactly. our life, right? 
the, let's talk about a little bit shift here okay. to the future of work. Yes. Um, and um, what we're seeing, what you're seeing um, in terms of what the future of work looks like for all of us and yes. what is the role of well-being? Does it, does it become more important, less important? Um, you know, different. So, what what are what are you seeing in the research yeah. when when we look at the future of work because it's changing so rapidly. It is, and, and I, I'm going to say this pretty strongly. I think well being in the future of work is going to differentiate high performing firms. Not only is it going to be able to attract, it's also going to be able to retain high quality talent because there's three things that we're seeing in the future of work that are changing. The first is what we do is fundamentally changing. So it's sometimes it's funny to think back, you know, 150 years ago, 98% of the economy was agriculture. We were farming. Yeah. Now that's less than 2%. You know, and so what we're seeing is this net job growth in highly cognitive human areas. So we know technology is coming and that it is here and automated technologies are taking over some of the routine repetitive work. Yeah. So what's left over is the highly cognitive, creative, intellectual work. And as a result, the mind becomes that much more of a differentiator and high performance. And so when people were facing scarcity, you know, in manufacturing settings or, or where they were doing tasks quite literally done by their with their hands, the distractions in their mind maybe weren't as important or weren't as um, influential to their performance. But now when you and I are going to be tasked with actually coming up with new ideas and creating intellectual capital. And solving some of, you know, large organizations' most difficult problems and working with them to do that. You have to be in the yeah. right headspace and you have to have the well-being to do so. Yeah. And so I think we're going to see a really a fundamental shift towards companies thinking this is a nice to have to understanding, just like Henry Ford did back in the 1920s when, you know, he's applauded for making the 40-hour work week from nine to five. He did that simply because he realized workers were more productive. It was an economic gain, and I think we're going to see the same thing in the future of work. Rest and recovery, well-being is going to differentiate and actually make us more productive in the long run. The research is just one dimension to the business case. But now let's look at the organizational perspective. What's truly on the mind of leaders? I spoke to Mike Preston, Deloitte's chief talent officer. You know, it's really kind of interesting for me because at a personal level, this is one of my core values. When I think about what defines me, I've always had kind of a work hard, play hard mentality. And I didn't think of it in the early days as well-being for my health or my sanity or dealing with stress. It was just part of who I wanted to be. So I've always had a desire to be involved in sports and do things outside to have kind of a whole life, if you will. I came into the CTO role and I wanted to think about what our talent strategy would be. And I settled on together with the leaders, this notion that we're a leadership culture focused on the development and well-being of all of our people. So the well-being component was, was part of the strategy from the beginning. And that was based on our own knowledge of our people through survey work that we'd done and outside in information we gathered that really spoke to what drove the millennial generation. Because at Deloitte, that's about 55, approaching 60% of our population. And we know for a fact they want to be developed, they value inclusion, but the fourth component is well-being. And we have to design structures and systems that will engage and attract talent because the research is out there. We do think, of course, that it drives better performance when people can be their authentic self, they bring their whole self, they have figured out what their mission in life is, and they're grounded, if you will. So well-being is really a fundamental aspect of the culture we're trying to create at Deloitte on the talent side. And right there at the end, you mentioned culture. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of research out there. There's a lot of data out there. Um, that talks about investing in well-being and have it, you know, as it, it's a bottom line issue. Um, you know, we, we know that it lowers health care costs. We know um, that it lowers absenteeism rates, turnover rates, things like that. That has all been tracked. Um, and, of course, I think that's important for any organization. Yeah, uh, for sure. But when I say development, I'm thinking of developing leaders holistically at work, at home, in their personal lives, in the communities. We want to create people that have a mission in their own lives that we can help support. I think of it like this. People are along their life journey with us, and it's our job to help them integrate their personal life with their work life along each individual journey. 
I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. When we talk about work-life fit, which is where we started. We talked about work-life balance. I think it's about integrating and having a life that's multifaceted where work and life connect. They coexist. And you make priorities and you sometimes lean one way or the other. But I didn't really even think about the absenteeism savings and what it might do to some of our costs around healthcare. What I thought about it was this notion of an engagement index. And if I could create a strategy where people were more engaged and I knew well-being would be part of that, we'd have lower turnover, we would have healthier people that wanted to stay longer, they'd have affinity for the brand. Even if they didn't go on to be future partners, principals, or managing directors, they would leave and they'd be colleagues for life. And so I think we're on the right track because our turnover is at an all-time low right now. It's uh, the turnover of our high performers is at an all-time low. So people do have an affinity for the brand. Our, our scores on our own internal talent surveys are going up. We get high marks on well-being. Uh, we're not where we need to be, though, yet. So I don't want to oversell it. We, we went up about 10, 12 points last year on the well-being related questions but we still are in a fairly stressful business that has demands it has deadlines there's a lot of effort that it takes to deliver world-class services to very demanding clients but what we're starting to learn is that if we manage that stress and that we use it to our advantage to make sure we get things done but then we also build in recovery time we're able to integrate well-being into the work what role specifically do you believe that leaders play in fostering a culture of well-being in an organization and, and um, what guidance, what advice, what role do you think um, leaders at all levels of the organization play in, in fostering this kind of culture? Yeah, it's a great topic because everything that happens at Deloitte happens at the team level. The client service team is the organizational structure that gets things done. And when you take it all the way up to the top, you start with Kathy Engelbert. And as our CEO, does she walk the talk? Does she talk about well-being? Does she include it in her own actions? And she absolutely does. So what we have is a group of leaders who understand that our business can be stressful and that well-being is an important part of defining what we want for our talent culture. But when you get into the actual client service delivery teams, they get stressed by deadlines. They have a lot of work to do. And so the idea of role modeling the behavior at the team leader level, whether that's a manager to a senior or a partner to a senior manager, it doesn't really matter where you are in that hierarchy. You do have to role model it and you do have to have discussion around it. Even if you can't always have balance or integrate personal during a crisis time where you're trying to hit a deadline, you should still be talking about it. You should still model it and you should value and protect people's time off once they get to a point where they can take some time off because it's not going to be linear. They can't take it off, you know, exactly pro rata throughout the year. There's client deadlines, things happen, but the, the leaders have to role model it. They have to set the example. They have to actually take time off themselves. They have to actually be careful about sending emails on the weekend that aren't urgent. And I do that on my own teams. I have a standing agreement with anybody that works with me that if I send you an email about something, you get to it when you can get to it. If I have an urgent request, I will note that in the request or I'll pick up the phone and call you on your mobile. There's a difference between me sending something on a Saturday and me expecting people to respond on a Saturday. And I've created that understanding with my team. I think all of our leaders need to do that. The way I like to see it happen is at the beginning of a project that a team is organizing around. Let's say it's to deliver a technology product or a deliverable or a tax return or whatever it is. You get the team together at the beginning of the project and you talk about their roles. You talk about the deliverables. You talk about this is going to be a lot of hard work for six, eight weeks. And here's the team and who's going to do what. Included in that dialogue should be some conversation about well-being and how, go around the table and talk to people about what could they use over the course of the next six weeks that would make this an even better place to work for them. And somebody might suggest they want to go home early on Thursday nights because they play in a soccer league or that their child has a performance or whatever it is. And if you talk about it openly at the team level, you'll find out pretty quickly that most team members are willing to cover for other team members for things that our people feel are important. Not every time, not every day, but by even talking about it, you create some option value with your people that you care about it. So fundamentally, it's about role modeling the behavior as leaders at all levels. And when we do that, people will believe that we're serious. 
So what do you say to the team leader that um, thinks conceptually that this is an idea, but that's not really how these things play out, or when it's crunch time, it, it sounds like a nice thing to do, um, but you know, how's that really going to affect my my client work or or my team and being able to get things done in terms of my team being productive? Because that's certainly, um, I think, some of the fear that exists that right. all of this, you know, sounds great and it sounds nice and why wouldn't we do it? Um, but when the, you know, the pedal hits the metal, so to speak, um, you know, how do I, how do I actually do this in a way that isn't going to negatively impact me as a leader and impact the project that I'm on? What do you, what, what guidance do you give those team leaders? Yeah, I, I think you do have to let people every once in a while, even in a crunch time, have some space if that's what they need. There's nothing wrong with some stress. What's wrong is stress without recovery. And if we don't build in recovery, you're not going to have a high-performing team. So from the team leader standpoint, it can really be about self-survival for them because if they burn their people up, they're not going to have a high-performing team and their deliverable won't be as good. And they're going to have to find new players to inject in the team. And maybe some of our team leaders would say, that's fine, just get me a new person. Well, that's not the culture we want. We want a culture where people feel as though they are working for a high-performing team, delivering world-class services, and they get the chance to do it while having an integrated work and personal life. So I would just tell that manager that's in crunch time, it's okay to be in crunch time and it's okay to be demanding, but you've got to create an environment where people want to work on your teams, because if you do, you'll get better people, you'll progress further with the firm, and I think you'll be happy. It's sometimes easier to actually create the case for investing in well-being than it is to really show to your leaders what it means from a day-to-day perspective in a work setting. Culture here is key. If you can't embed well-being into the employee population, then it becomes really just lip service. So as an individual, as a team leader, and as a team member, what does well-being look like and how is it activated? Let's talk to Lindsay Sytek, a busy manager at Deloitte Consulting, uh, to get an idea of how well-being behaviors can be implemented on teams. I learned probably a couple years ago that there's more to well-being than just being active. And it probably took going to a doctor and having just some bad news delivered. You know, I'm young and here I am, like higher blood pressure, a little overweight, and I'm thinking, what the heck? So uh, tell me a little bit about what life as a consultant is like. Oh, boy. (laughs) Well, if you ask a room of 50 different consultants, you'd probably get 50 different answers. But I'd say some of the themes that would come out would be challenging, um, fast-paced. You know, you're surrounded by high performers, so you're always on. Um, And at times, it can be really tiring. Um, You know, I would add that consulting is all that I know. I joined Deloitte um, as an intern and then full-time. So consulting is what I live and breathe every day. But at the end of the day, I do find it just to be extremely rewarding. You're giving back to your clients. You're helping them solve all of their biggest problems. Great. So tell me a little bit of when you started to become fo- focused on well-being in, in your own life and then how that has translated to um, you know, the way that you manage your team and, and deal with others within your organization. Sure. So... If I think about my adult life, I'd say I always thought I was focused on well-being. Um, but when I think about what that means to me, I think, oh, I, you know, I've always run. I've always exercised. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Like, I'm active and this isn't working. So at the same time, I was staffed on a long-term project. I'm on the road Monday through Thursday. And I just thought something needs to change because I'm too young to feel like I'm leading an unhealthy lifestyle. And so... As I found myself being more aware of my own well-being, I also was taking a step back and focusing on, well, what about my team? And it was on this longer-term project where it was a grueling project, and, you know, morale was a little bit lower, and just I noticed making small little changes made a tremendous amount of difference. So, you know, little things like Monday nights we'd go to the grocery store. As something as small as that, when you're on the road and you don't have access to your normal refrigerator, like, wow, okay, I don't need to be eating out all the time. And so, you know, I found just making those small little changes for the team not only improved my mental attitude, it improved the team's attitude. Um, And I think 
if you think about from consulting, you know, you're serving your clients. And I think with a better, clearer mind, then you can better serve yeah. your clients. Absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned um, at Deloitte on on our journey in well-being is, is the whole notion of um, role modeling behavior and permission, which is incredibly important for a uh, team leader like yourself. So, you know, the simple act of going to the grocery store or, you know, going to the gym together, not only does it build um, camaraderie mm-hmm. and, and trust with the team members, but with you as their leader, they're looking to you and they're saying, oh, I am getting this permission. You know, if you're not doing the things to take care of yourself, then they're not going to believe that it's okay for them to do that as well. And so role modeling behavior is, is really important. You know, one of the things that I have at my desk, and I might have been somehow from you, is I have a well-being basket. So I have a well-being basket, you know, with a yoga guide. And so people walk by my desk, and I'm like, take this home for the night, try it out. Or an adult coloring book, which some people kind of like, well, I'm not going to sit down and just color. But it's just the having those things out in the open yeah. in the environment, I think, adds a fun element and it you know if you have a little mental break and you want to do a brain teaser it just it's a nice little stress and it goes back to the notion again I think of permission right Mm -hmm. having it there having it visible having you promoting it to people saying hey try this and I think you know this is all from me being a team leader perspective but you know I am a team member on other projects and so you know even when I was starting my career it's sometimes you feel maybe intimidated about talking about things like, should I be responding to an email on a weekend? But as a team member, I would just encourage everyone to have that conversation because your managers may not even realize the example that they're setting. The impact that it's having. Yeah. Yeah. And so they might think, oh, I'm just getting caught up on emails. I'm not expecting them to respond. But as a manager, if you don't have that conversation with some of your more junior team members, or if the junior team members aren't having that conversation with their managers, no one knows what each other's expectations are. Yeah. So then as the more junior team member, you're thinking, wow, I'm getting an email from my manager. I need to drop what I'm doing and I need to respond immediately. And that is not a healthy behavior right. and that is not anything that we would want to encourage. So. That, that's, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I think that's so important because – you know, I can I can pretty much you know tell you that that that's the conversation with your manager um, would go well because I, I think as a as a team leader um, you want to know those things and you want to understand the way that your team members want to work and what impacts their well being because as a as a leader if you can understand that you also understand how you can get the best from them and and help them perform at their best and serve their clients at their best and you know what organization doesn't want that. On a personal level, um, you know, are you feeling less tired? (laughs) How is your rest and recovery looking like? Because that's an incredibly important aspect of well-being as well. Yes. And, you know, I am feeling less tired. I'm feeling more balanced. And I found myself more patient. I was calmer. Um, I just felt generally happier. Um, And so, you know, the mental state and the change in my mental state was, was evident from some of these small little things. You know, thinking about the health aspect, you know, my, my blood pressure has gone down. And, you awesome. know, so from that <laughs> yeah. from that aspect, um, you know, little things like that have helped just feel well-rested. And I think when I'm well-rested, then I'm bringing a better version of myself. I'm more productive during the work days, and I'm just a better leader overall. You don't have to have the title of well-being leader to bring well-being to life at your organization. I really hope that some of what you heard today can help you make well-being a priority in your personal and professional life. I'm so grateful that Mike Preston, Kelly Monahan, and Lindsay Sytek could talk with us about well-being. Thank you so much to our producers, and thank you for listening. You can follow along with the Work Well podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword well-being to hear more. If you have a topic you would like to hear on the Work Well by Deloitte podcast series or maybe a story you'd like to share, reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jennifer Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We are always open to recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thanks and be well.